DC is in a bit of a pickle. With the admission of James Gunn as the new architect of the DCU, the universe has essentially been rebooted in order to wipe the slate clean and get a fresh start. However, Warner Bros. and DC have a few movies taking place in the ruins of the Snyderverse that they can't possibly cancel and use the corpses of them as tax write-offs because of how much money has been sunk into them. Those movies being The Flash, Aquaman 2, and Blue Beetle. Today's subject is the first one, The Flash. Or more appropriately, The Crash, because this movie has post-production nightmare written all over it. The setup here is that Barry Allen is taking the loss of his mother hard and he's unable to prove his father's innocence in the present. One day, out of distress, Barry runs so fast that he creates a time bubble that allows him to scroll through time like a DVR and revisit the past. He uses this power to rewind time and save his mother, but unfortunately, the butterfly effect takes hold and an entirely alternate universe is created from Barry simply placing a can of crushed tomatoes in his mother's shopping cart. So before we begin... Alright, now let's begin. The biggest problem with this movie is that it's more stuff than a bottom at Pride Parade. <laughs> Why the fuck did I write that? There's too much shit. Way too much shit. We've got not just one Barry, two Barry Allens, a Michael Keaton Batman, Superman's cousin Kara Zor-El, General Zod, a spiky dark flash demon, time travel, a retelling of Man of Steel's events, and verbal exposition everywhere to explain it all. This movie clocks in at 2 hours and 20 minutes and you can feel every fucking minute of it, dude. No thanks to the second Ezra Miller in this film who is even more insufferable than the original one. To this day, I still think that this was one of the most egregious miscastings in all of Hollywood. I can't say who I would have gotten to play The Flash, but it wasn't the mad goose wizard with a lock on chair launcher aimed specifically at women, that's for sure. The Mad Goose Wizard. Bruh. The second Barry is one of the most obnoxious characters I've ever seen in the DCU. Nearly every scene he's in, he simply cannot stop talking. Everything that comes out of his mouth before the climax has to be some kind of joke or comic relief. Speaking of which, the comedy in this movie is so wonky and poorly timed and often results in mood whiplash or an abrupt change in tone for a scene as defined by TV tropes. One of the most unbearable examples is this shot right before the final battle where Barry 2 has his makeshift mask all fucked up. This is the shot right before they get into the fight of their lives against General Zod. Not to mention that this is also the shot right before the sequence that's supposed to be a bit of a downer. Context being that Barry 1 realizes that this is an inevitability point. A point in time that cannot be changed no matter what. We'll, we'll get to the time travel shenanigans shortly. So in essence, Zod wins. I won't win. And this universe is doomed. Never mind how stupid that sounds when talking about a multiverse and how the inciting incident of this story is the fact that Barry placed a can of crushed tomatoes in his mother's shopping cart, it's also kind of weird that this behaves as kind of a after the ending film for Michael Keaton's Batman. Gotham is now the safest city in the country. Alfred has passed away and Bruce has essentially retired from the cowl. There's no real evidence stating that this couldn't be after Batman returns. I mean, shit, he has the same Batmobile from that movie. If it fits, it sits. You feel me? There's one interesting retcon that is applied to Man of Steel here. During Barry's one explanation of what General Zod is planning to do, he reveals to Barry too that he too was in Metropolis to try and help, but he wasn't experienced enough and only managed to save one little boy. Ah yes, it's not enough that Zod attacked Metropolis. Bruce Wayne also had to be there that day so we can understand why he hated Superman and BVS. And Barry Allen had to be in Metropolis because... reasons? And wait a minute, you're telling me that Barry got his powers the very day before Zod invaded Earth in 2013? What an absolute bullshit coincidence. Alright, let's finally crack open this rancid can of ass known as... Time, time travel. travel. 
Time travel is one of the worst storytelling devices one could use because it requires bulletproof, ironclad script doctoring and drafting in order for it to simply make sense and not be littered with plot holes. Avengers Endgame, Sonic 06, Life is Strange, Interstellar, Looper, Bioshock Infinite, all of these have attempted to tell stories involving time travel in some capacity and each of them have some kind of plot hole that only creates even more plot holes. So I'm not even going to play games here and pretend The Flash even had a chance at getting this right. What exactly is the damage in this movie? Well firstly I want to address how Dark Flash was created. Dark Flash is Barry 2 after trying over and over again for several years to stop General Zod's invasion only to fail every time. He says that he pushed Barry 1 into 2013 so that he could create Dark Flash by giving Barry 2 his powers. But the question is... How would Dark Flash get his powers in the first place without Barry One being in his universe? In order to be in the time bubble in the first place, Dark Flash would need to get his powers in a way that is independent of Barry One. What's also dumb is that Keaton's Bruce mentions that time is not linear, so when you make a change at one point in time, it also changes the past of the new universe you just created. So Dark Flash pushing Barry 1 into 2013 should not have created Dark Flash, it should have created another universe that Dark Flash can no longer access. They insultingly attempt to hand wave it away by having Dark Flash mention that it is indeed a paradox. You mentioning the fact that it's a paradox does not fix the fact that it's a fucking paradox. Next is the fact that the Bruce Wayne in the Close Enough timeline is now George Clooney instead of Ben Affleck. What makes this stupid is the fact that this switch happens because Barry moved the cans of tomatoes from the lower shelf to the top shelf so his father raises his head and his face is visible on the CCTV camera, thus proving his alibi. Why in the shit would this change Batman's entire face when the CCTV footage takes place well after Bruce Wayne was born and... This is, again, the close enough timeline where everything else is exactly the same as before. George Clooney's Bruce even alludes to the fact that he has the same memories as Ben Affleck's Batman. What the hell is the deal with this? Lastly, they never account for the flashes that were already in the point in time the two flashes entered from the time bubble. Such as the shot of the two flashes touching heels together. The flashes from the future run back to that point and re-enter the fight to try and win a different way, only for these two original flashes to never be mentioned again. There should be four flashes, not just two. If anything, you should be able to win by grabbing the two flashes from the past each time you go back to the past. By attempt number five, you have ten flashes. No Kryptonian will be able to withstand ten flashes. Hell, you could do this an infinite amount of times. You could create an army of flashes that could destroy the Kryptonian army with ease. But we can't do that because it would get in the way of the themes. Now, I'm not knocking the theme of this movie. It's a pretty sound one. Learn to live with the scars you have because those scars and traumas make you who you are. But its implementation is so fucking clunky, dude. For example, they changed why Batman put on the cape to fight crime. In this movie, he states that he put the cape on because he thought it would bring his parents back for some reason, seemingly as a way to cope. In the comics and most other films, he puts the cape on for vengeance, justice, and to ensure that no other child would have to endure what he went through. You really should not change your character's personalities and backstories just to fit the theme. I'm running out of larger points, so let me list a few smaller ones just to wrap this up. Batman had to be convinced to save the world. That's just wild. The scene with Barry 1 and his mom at the end of the movie was actually pretty solid. Too bad it was attached to this movie. Kara Zor-El is nothing more than a character whose death only acts as a game over screen and signifies to the two Barrys that they failed and need to go back and try again. There was no reason for Barry 1 to not tell Barry 2 that this universe is the result of saving their mother from being murdered. The CGI in this movie is fucking atrocious and makes the movie feel like it's taking place in a pre-rendered PS3 cutscene with live action actors spliced in. For example, in the DVR time bubble, why did they make all the actors into CGI? Why didn't you just like record them in live action and just digitally duplicate them around? It's overproduced nonsense, that, that's all I'm saying. Also, the director's cope for said piss-poor CGI is hilarious. Michael Shannon seemed to act like he genuinely didn't want to be there. There's an interesting amount of moments of Ezra Miller's Barry saving children in this movie. I wonder what that's about. The beginning of this movie confirms that Batfleck kills. 
This movie strangely treats the Snyder Cut as canon, and at the same time, it doesn't. Iris West alludes to the moment Barry saved her in the Snyder Cut, but at the same time, Barry forgot that he could reverse time. Why he would do something so confused, I have no idea. Well, when your universe is literally dying, I guess I could see why. The movie forgot the reason why the Kryptonians wore transparent helmets. In Man of Steel, it was established that Zod and his minions wore the helmets because they were not used to being in Earth's atmosphere. Once Zod's helmet is damaged and he's exposed, he starts to experience the hypersensitivity to sight and sound that Clark did earlier in that film. The implication being that the Kryptonian heightened perception was a result of being exposed to Earth's atmosphere. In The Flash, there's a scene where Zod and Feyora meet with the US military, and upon seeing that they have failed to hand over the Kryptonian, Zod kills the human and orders an attack. During the chaos, Kara utters the word no, while she's literally thousands of feet in the air and several miles away. Zod somehow hears this with his helmet on. Then he proceeds to just let her leave the area. Oh my god, dude. This fucking movie, man. That's all I've got for this movie. Sure, it has one scene that really tugged at my heartstrings, but is it worth sitting through two hours of dying cinematic universe in order to see it? No, absolutely not. Thank you all for watching, and thank you all for the continued support of a small content creator like me. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you'd like to support me and check out a novel from an indie author, hit the link in the description and take a look at my sci-fi military series, Blur Havoc. It would be much appreciated. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you next time.